Dear members of the Academy of Sciences and Arts, dear guests, it is once again a great pleasure for me to open the new season of the lecture series Arts Meets Medicine as president of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts. The two deans of the class of arts, Violetta Dinescu and of medicine, Dujan Schubert, have once again put together a splendid program. For this, once again, our heartfelt thanks. This lecture series expresses a core message of our academy, namely to combine science, medicine, and art. Indeed, the topics this time range from cell biology, brain research, artificial intelligence, and quantum physics to music, painting, literature, and philosophy. Tonight, we begin with the cell biology of an organism, including the human organism, a tremendously complex system of cells whose supply and communication networks are reminiscent of social and economic systems. One should also speak musically of an orchestra that produces rhythms of different temporal scaling. Although I have been working on the mathematical dynamics of complex systems for decades, I am always amazed at how these complex dynamics organize themselves and can regenerate themselves to a certain extent in the event of disturbances. The brain, which is the subject of the second lecture, is an excellent example of such a complex cellular system, which is the basis and prerequisite of all our knowledge, consciousness, and emotions. How these brain states are generated in detail is often still not understood in science today. As a result, our behavior is hardly predictable. Even today's artificial intelligence is based on complex neural networks with billions of parameters, but they are only statistical machines that can only calculate statistically expected probabilities of data. Albert with amazing, startling, and frightening similarities to human performance in literature and arts. And I remind you of the chat GPT. Because of their parameter explosion, these networks are also often unpredictable. We have and will continue to talk about this in other lectures in this lecture series. In the end, however, they are still only digital simulations. Feeling and experiencing emotions, love, joy, and suffering, and pain, that is still reserved for us humans and the other living beings on this planet Earth. I wish you exciting discussions. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce Maria Drupnik, uh, my friend. Uh, we were together at the same institute when he was a uh, young researcher, now PhD student actually. And later on, he was very, he was really excellent researcher. And he moved uh, to Vienna now he's professor in Vienna, professor in Maribor, professor at Alma Mater, and well known in the field of uh, 
people that study secretion of insulin, but other th substances too. So here maybe I should do some philosophical introduction. You know, in old times, people were looking at whole yes. animals. You know, in beginning, looking at whole animals, then the whole tissue. And uh, with time, we came to look at one single molecule in a membrane patch and see how this molecule yep. works, how, how it conditions is current. And uh, Marian did something else, moving from one molecule, one cell, and the whole tissue, you know, selected the whole bunch of beta cells. And this is, again, going to the same thing that we did many, many centuries ago, but in a very deep, much more precise manner. And I think you can present your work and everything else because you are quite an interesting person. So I think your lecture will be quite enjoyable. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks to Vileta and Dushan for giving me the opportunity to present my work. Do you see my presentation as before? So um, I have the opportunity for, to contribute to the lecture of this series, Art Meets Science. I appreciate art a lot, but I'm primarily a scientist and I would like to show a little bit of the science, what we do in our lab. As Dushan already mentioned, we try to understand um, uh, biological systems beyond the level of cells. I will talk about rhythms and the rhythmicity in nature refers to the inher inherent often cyclical patterns and processes. So, I mean, it could be the whole cycle of life, you know, from birth to death, it could be uh, seasonal, it could be um, just kind of circadian rhythms, could be ultradian. And since I will be talking about metabolism, we can see that there is a lot of oscillations which can be also driven by our activity. So at night, our metabolism is lower. And then during the day when we eat, we can actually have kind of like longer waves when the, our metabolic system, particularly the secretion of hormones and uh, um, metabolism is higher just due to the activity that we do. So we eat breakfast, we eat lunch and so on. But I would also like to show that basically not just the circadian rhythms and some ultradian rhythms, but we have also very, very fast rhythms in our body. Actually, we measure all the frequencies of all the oscillations in our, our surrounding in nature, so roughly if we compare it to the average frequency of our heart. So basically about one hertz is one per second. This is how fast typically our heart beats. And we compare everything basically to this basic frequency. In our body, actually, we have also events that go way faster. We can actually come in the frequency range, which is comparable to the frequency ranges which we can get in modern machines like cars. So we can operate also with at about 50 hertz or higher, which would then be equivalent to about 3,000 rounds per minute. In my case, I will be primarily talking about calcium oscillations. So I can actually measure calcium oscillation in a part of the cell, which we call cytosol. I will show the cell again and explain that a little bit more. And I will tell you that basically all these oscillations that we can see here from the fastest to the slowest actually are basically the same thing. They are just temporal summation of some oscillations which are kind of limited by the protein activity. I will talk about intracellular calcium release channels like randin receptors, which are known from heart and muscles. And I will talk about IP3 receptors, which are also known to be intracellular calcium release channels. And all these events actually prevent some sort of a beat or the way how our cells function. And particularly when we try to understand how the collective of cells be behave, we can see that these beats can be interpreted locally in the cell or just subcellular and then between the cells and then later on also on the whole organ level. Yeah. And since I will be talking about metabolism and economy of metabolism, I will focus on one organ in our body, basically, which is supposed to be the major agent of the economy of metabolism. So this is pancreas. And basically, and then I will explain how pancreas works with this interplays of calcium oscillations in different cells in pancreas. Pancreas is basically a small organ, um, which is nicely hidden, well hidden between the other internal organs, but it's basically a kind of hazardous material storage facility. 
basically it has contains very dangerous substances. You know, it stores on one hand digestive enzymes that help us digest food. But since we are made of the same substances as our food, because we can also cannibalize ourselves, basically it is dangerous if these digestive enzymes are released and activated in our body in the uncontrolled way because we can digest ourselves what can happen in the framework of pancreatitis or something like this. On the other hand, we also have endocrine hormones, for example, particularly insulin. Insulin is a very, very toxic compound. I mean, if we, extre if we, would, if we would release everything what we have in our pancreas at once, it would be like a few thousand times the lethal doses of basically because it would remove everything what we what we have in our blood for the for the metabolism of many cells in blood and elsewhere outside the plasma and then basically we cannot function without this immediate availability of of this of these nutrients typically we are aware of pancreas only if something goes wrong. Most often is this pancreatitis, we have like infection or alcohol abuse, or this would be diabetes mellitus because we can get it from several reasons. It's genetic, environmental, and we are old enough, we all actually get diabetes. But otherwise, we hardly ever think about pancreas. In school, when we talk about pancreas and diabetes, we typically hear Basically, that it, it's composed of two parts. One part is kind of part of the digestive system. I would call it like a ministry of digestion assimilation. And the other part would be endocrine part, which basically controls um, um, nutrients in blood, particularly glucose. And I will tell you why glucose has kind of like this special, special purpose in our body. It is interesting that historically and also traditionally, we deal with exocrine part of pancreas separately. So we have separate clinic clinics, clinics for that. There is a special physiology for that. And we have endocrine physiology. And there is very little overlap between those two ministries, which is, I've, in my opinion, also one of the reasons why, we, which prevented us to actually get a really deeper insight into the physiology of this organ. One feature that is very interesting also is that in pancreas, um, uh, basically endocrine cells are distributed. So they are many, we have human beings. So this would be human on, on the right side here. We have about one to 2 million small groups of endocrine cells, which are distributed all over pancreas. We don't have one organ like, like uh, adrenal gland would be or thyroid gland. We have many, many, many small organs, which are about 100 micrometers big, which is not too big. But I will try to explain why this distributive nature, distributed nature and why this size of the islets actually is important, since it is basically also very evolutionary conserved. Basically, all mammals actually have the same size islets, although we can actually come in very different sizes. You know, we can come from mouse to human, which is a few thousand times factor difference, and we can go to whale, which is basically another few times bigger than we are. Yeah, And this scaling, actually, you can maybe read in much better in the Jeff West book about how the, the things in life scale. So to try to understand, you know, how this basic communication, basic signaling in one of these cells here actually uh, goes on. Basically, just a little bit about cell biology. This is one of the nice presentations of cells, of a cell which actually has a lot of internal compartmentalization. So it has nucleus, which has contains genome. It has mitochondria to supply energy, apart from glycolysis, which actually happens in the cytosol. It has endoplasmic reticulum, which is basically a very big network of, of cisterns where we typically synthesize proteins, but we can also use it for the local communication, as I will be talking about. But particularly, we communicate over the different membranes in our cells using ions. You, we can use sodium, potassium, or most of, mostly for the signaling, it will, we will use calcium. Calcium in the resting condition is almost does not exist in cytosol. It is basically 100 times less calcium than proteins in, in a certain volume. So meaning that basically, although many proteins bind calcium, but very few of them actually have the pleasure to bind it 
to bind calcium in the resting condition. So whenever calcium changes, whenever it is released out of this compartment into the cytosol, basically this means a very important information. It means like a beat of a drum, which can use, be used for the signaling locally, or it can actually provide signal also that spreads, spreads wider. This is a very naive understanding of how the cells look like because in principle, our cells are packed with membranes. Basically the same volume of space, uh, of free space actually is, is there as the, the volume of the membrane. So basically our cells are really uh, packed with cells and in my body, Basically, if I would calculate the surface of all, all these biological membranes, particularly inside the cells, the total surface would be about one square kilometer or one million square meters, meaning this is how much of the surface you need to actually support a complex life like, like we are. And I said for the communication, for the signaling, we can clearly use, um, uh, we can clearly use small ions that actually can provide this kind of information. What is metabolic economy? Like in the real-time economy, uh, we basically have you know, features that belong to production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services, which can be happening in a society or a kind of geographically limited area, which can also be our organism is also kind of like geographically limited area. Né? It is rather challenging to govern the economy of a state. And I would like to show you that basically it's not much simpler to govern the economy of our organism. And pancreas is a very important agent to do that. So what means production in our body? I mean, first we have to assimilate, reabsorb raw materials, what we do from the, from the gut. So everything what we eat is not in our body yet. We have to first absorb it. So if we can absorb it through our gut, then basically we did not actually internalize the nutrient. And for some of the nutrients like fats, we actually have to use technology within our cells, enterocytes to change those, to really um, transform fats into the form which can be absorbed then and actually distributed to, to, the, to the cells. And this production part, assimilation part is typically a part that belongs to the, to the roles uh, that acinar cells play. They would secrete digestive enzymes, they would they, they secrete bicarbonate, and they would actually help this absorption in the duodenum mostly. Distribution and consumption is more limited to the function of the endocrine pancreas. So basically primarily insulin, insulin here. Most of you have heard about insulin. We use it in typically in, in, in therapy to lower blood glucose, but basically physiologically, this definition does not hold because if somebody tells you insulin is the only hormone that can lower blood glucose in physiology, things that are important don't come in one solution. They are highly redundant. There are many, many mechanisms to control blood pressure, you know, or, or kind of like glucose that is high enough in our plasma. So we have at least five formula system that constantly raise glucose and only one that actually reduces it. So obviously the pressure, evolutionary pressure is to go up, not to go down. Why we need glucose in our plasma? Because majority of our cells by number. So this graph shows you the fraction of cells by number in our body. You see that how many erythrocytes we have in comparison to other cell types and, and then lymphocytes, platelets, all these blood cells actually actually represent the majority of our cells. And they all depend only on glucose because they typically do glycolysis. They don't do oxidophosphorylation. So basically they don't negotiate for anything than, than, than just glucose. Even after 40 days of starvation, your blood cells will get their 36 grams of glucose and nothing else. Although brain can actually negotiate for other nutrients for that, for that matter. So we need glucose for the basic operation of our cells. And so the problem, the peril is if the glucose goes too low, not too high, which is kind of like the issue that appears to be kind of a problem in our civilization because we are typically overfed and we don't move enough. Yeah, But in the nat nature, the problem is otherwise, it's on the other side. So we don't want to be in the, in the, in the, in the hypoglycemia. There is no stress that would be harder induce a release of adrenaline that would be higher than actually when we don't have enough glucose in our body. Yeah, so that's that's one thing that it's good to, to understand. So how do pancreatic beta cells control? How do actually secrete just the right amount of insulin not to drive glucose too low so that would 
put all these blood cells in, into peril and actually they would not be able to communicate. And this is a rather, rather complicated system. We were talking pre previously about the economic system and, and, and in our cells actually they behave very responsibly. You know, they are under control, but there is a lot of autonomy, basically, which is also on the periphery. So they typically know what they need to do. And this is something also what could be drawn from the philosophy of Daniel Dennett, what we also discussed before, that basically there is a little bit of conscience also on the on the every part of our body, not just, just central. So beta cell actually has now been described with a very simple model. You know, you actually use glucose which is transported into cell, turned into ATP. ATP kind of like depolarizes, activates the cells, and this activation of the cell, the depolarization, would then activate voltage-activated calcium channel, just a source of calcium. So there is no calcium in the cytosol normally, but when it would come from the outside, where it's a lot of calcium, basically this would trigger exocytosis. So the fusion of granules that contain insulin with the plasma membrane and insulin would be slowly released, slowly because it's in the form of a crystal and actually um, uh, uh, um, can actually diss dissolve slowly. And this is also good for physiology like that. So I, can, I have a bit of a problem. You know, if I know that my cells are, would be activating in, in this way, how can I actually accommodate all these different conditions? How do I actually accommodate all the challenges that maybe metabolic economy can present to me? You know, and and I've been working on this preparation for about twenty years. I've been working on neurons before, and actually I was has been asking this question all along. And for the first ten years, we tried to reproduce this model, failed miserably, and then we just had to move on on that because there's no way we would get the dynamic range, the needed dynamic range with just this simple model. Let me show you how these cells actually activate. So this is one islet of Langerhans. So this is the collective of beta cells. Majority of islet is are beta cells. All these green cells here, they're beta cells. They activate when you put them into 8 glucose. Now we are in the 8 glucose and you will see every time when the, it's darker color, this means that the cells actually have higher calcium concentration in the cytosol. The kind of the pattern of this activity is very erratic. So it's not that they would all depolarize at the same time and then march like soldier on the uh, army parade for the one of the May holidays or something like this. But they actually get, get, get they can have very various patterns of activity. Sometimes the wave comes from one way and sometimes goes the other way. You know, for biologists to understand that it is not it is not so easy. Yeah. And then we, when we go back to six millimolar glucose, we are now in this range. The cells will slowly inactivate, so they will not be active anymore. Some acinar cells will activate because they're more sensitive to glucose. And then when we go for the second time into eight glucose, you will see the cells will in the in the islet will start to activate again, and they will another pattern of activity will actually be produced. Yeah. In this way, we can understand that basically it's it's not likely so simple. There is likely connections between the cells. Cells have different sensitivities to, to glucose and other, and other compounds. So the whole thing may be a bit more complicated. To solve this issue, basically we invested into a data scientist, which helped us a lot to uh, understand our data, improve our data collection, turn the analysis into high throughput mode. So basically we could analyze huge data sets of data at once and actually try to understand what's going on. So Sujan, who was our data scientist, developed automatic detection of cells. So this would be one cell here. And you can see there's a, and nucleus is here, there's mostly cytosol here. And then on, on the basis of the correlation between the pixels, we can see what corresponds to one cell. And within this region of interest, we can then automatically detect the events. Yeah. So this would be every time when calcium rises, we can see these spikes, which is, which are which can be of different durations. And uh, when we try to kind of store them. We also store how high they are, how long they are. And we can just describe it, annotate them the way that we can actually use that for the further analysis. So we get a lot of events. So this is the same islet as I was showing you before, three representative traces. And then basically this is a collection of all events that had been recorded 
sorted by the how long they were. And some of the events are very short. They are in the range of 100 milliseconds. Majority of them, because it's already so darker here because there are so many parts at the same and they're very significant. So they have they deviate a lot from the from the regular noise. Are about a few seconds long, but some of them can also be hundreds of seconds long. And if we look more closely to these events, so the longest events are typically composed of faster events. And then when we look into the faster events, we see that they are composed of even faster events. There's a lot of self-similarity here to, to understand that basically everything what actually we see here, all these different duration of events is just like different wavelengths that you can see on the water body or something like this you know you can have big waves small waves but they're all kind of made of of water and limited by likely the surface tension or something like this and in this case here they're limited just by the protein release of calcium through the radina or ip3 receptors from the endoplasmic reticulum so when we have this kind of activity, we can then just map all the cells. So we can actually record hundreds of cells at the same time. And when we expose them to do different glucose concentration, and in this case, we were trying to find where the threshold is, where the cells basically activate. And we can see that if we drive the glucose concentration very slowly up, so we just change it for 0.1 millimolar, which is not much, you know. Basically, we'll see that when we progress with glucose concentration, different populations would progressively kind of like activate until we reach a certain threshold. And then basically, we can really see activation where the all cells, all of a sudden, from individual cells become a collective. So basically, they start to work as a collective, yeah. So initially, at sub-threshold, sub they are individuals. But we, when we go above the glucose threshold, they actually turn into collective. And then we have to deal with this kind of microorgan as a collective. This first part, we can still explain somehow with the closing of the voltage activated, uh, sort of, of opening of the voltage activated calcium channels with progressive glucose concentration. But I have some other evidences that tells, tells us likely that this pathway here may not be driving everything what I'm actually seeing here. So if I block those channels using like uh, one of the pharmacological inhibitors, this would be isredipine in this case. And isredipine works at saturating concentration works very fast. So I would expect if I would measure channels, they would be all blo blocked like, you know, maybe a couple of minutes after the application. But still the activity goes on. It changes a little bit. The events get shorter. Some cells actually stop earlier than the others, but the the the, the, the islets as a collective can run for you know tens, ten minutes or fifteen minutes later after that. So it is likely that we have something else to voltage activated calcium channels. And I will also been made, already been mentioning that they are intracellular calcium release channels, which are located on the plasma on the on the on the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. They can come in different forms like IP3 or ranadin receptors and they can have different different function. To actually show that there might be a ranadin receptors involved, I have three stimulation protocols here. So I first stimulated with a glucose washed out. And then the second time I stimulated them with high glucose, I actually used a very high concentration of ryanodin to basically block the ryanodin activity. And I see everything what actually has been fully active before this, all this synchronization is not there. They are just some sort of sub sub threshold like slow oscillation present present there yeah so suggesting that there is likely a release from the internal stores that there are more than one we can actually switch them from one to another so maybe you know with the glucose we would typically activate first ip3 they then they would inactivate they will go to a run and activation on the plateau phase but when we use acetylcholine, which is something like parasymp parasympathetic innervation or, you know, after we eat or something like this. Basically, the pattern changes a lot. And here, instead of radin receptors, I would have mostly radin receptors, act uh, sorry, IP3 receptors uh, active, you know, and they can switch between, between the receptor types uh, uh, dynamically during the activity of the cells. So basically, we need both Randin receptors, which actually are here, and we have IP3 receptors, which I can actually activate separately here. They are, inter they are in, 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 uh, independent, 
I can have a model, a mouse model, where I cannot use glucose to, to activate my cell, but I can use ligands like acetylcholine, which will then drive IP3 receptors. And these IP3 receptors would just activate IP3. Uh, so the, the, uh, this IP3 ligand would actually activate IP3 receptors, and I can activate those cells despite the fact that the membrane did not depolarize in those cells. Yeah, So they can be quite independent too. They can also interact both system. You know, they can be, so if I close IP3 receptors, I can switch the, the whole system into a ryanodine mode and so on. So the whole presentation of the cellular function of these both calcium receptors show us that they are, they can be working independently, but they are also connected. And in a way they are like a choreographed fountain. So basically if I close those channels here with cestospongin C, which is a specific blue, kind of a blocker, basically I can actually then activate, give more pressure to the others and I can give, get a different response. But what, how do I then talk, you know, among the cells, you know? So we can actually distinguish between weak and strong correlations between the entities, like, you know, humans can get involved in the strong interactions like fight or something like this, but we also have weak interactions. Like when we move our eyebrows, it can be often very significant. You know, if somebody looks at you and you can, he can read your body language, can understand what you mean when you raise your eyebrows and something similar, some sort of a weak interaction, weak correlation between the cells is very important for, for, for better cells function too meaning that uh, on average, they can be quite co correlated, yeah? But the correlation coefficient between all the cells in the islet is actually very weak. So basically it is something that would we normally ignore and has no significant statistics in that. But if we model that and we just delete these this weak correlations from the system, basically it means that the cells basically cannot talk to each other. We reduce, the probability of them being active for several orders of magnitude. So if we would remove the, the, the gap junctions between those cells, so this connection between the cells, basically the cells would be way, way less active than before. And the second feature is that basically there's a certain distance over which the cells can feel each other. So when they see the eyebrows equivalent of, 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 of correlation between, uh, between them, and this is roughly about 150 micrometers. And if you remember that the size of the, of the eyelids is basically very small, about 100 micro, micrometers and very conserved in evolution, it means that basically this weak correlation actually is like a mode of operation for the small collectives to be, to be active, yeah. And then of course, we, as I said, we did this scales well with the, with the, so why do we need these weak interactions and in small islets? Basically, um, there is uh, there are fundamental limits on, on how we can improve collective concentration sensing, you know, meaning that each cell in the islet can actually sense glucose or nutrients with uh, individual sensitivity, but if they work as the sparse packing, so a sparse collective, something like a bacterial colony, and the islets are big enough to fit into the sparse packing of communities, basically this would tremendously increase their sensitivity to, 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 to nutrients. So they can detect like, like an order of magnitude better than individual cells would be. And if we isolate, it, uh, isolate cells or, uh, or, or islets, basically they lose sensitivity to glucose just because we destruct this kind of like the normal in situ organization. There is also a possibility that cells, at least part of the cells move, they have cilia that then actually can optimize the sensory, the sensory activity. Um, this is something that, that we still need to actually start talk, thinking about. My last uh, slide, I would also like to address, so why do we need 1 million islets in our pancreas. Why don't we have one big islet? Obviously, the size defines how well the cells can communicate each other because they can. this local community can actually feel the surrounding much better. But on the other hand, 
all these million islets in our in our pancreas are connected with neurons so they can also communicate meaning that this dis distributed kind of like uh, um, uh, nature of the of the sensory system in the pancreas can also enables them to further improve the sensory uh, function that, that 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 basically we already improved on the level of the single islet to compare metabolic regulation with immune system you know immune system doesn't know with what it will be attacked at a certain moment. Yeah? So uh, it has to improvise sometimes and tries to avoid full-scale immune response because this is also deleterious for the organism. Also, our metabolic system doesn't know what kind of food we will eat and how much we will eat and how to respond to that. So it has a mechanism inside that basically can kind of like try to improvise and, and hit more or less, you know, the immune system is not always perfect, yeah? So basically it tries to respond in the range and tries to not to react fully to the certain stimulation because this can actually lead to kind of exhaustion of the system or similar. So when we stimulated our islet with four times the same concentration of glucose, we use high glucose in this case, was 60 millimolar, which is physiological. But the point what I want to show here is that basically each time the pattern of activity actually is slightly different, meaning that basically cells are responding contextually. They, they, the, the response is not always the same like we are actually used from the man-made technology. And eventually, our goal for the many years ahead, you know, scientifically, is to actually show that pancreas is the real-time analytical tool for nutrient metabolic senses, sensing, and this sensing has to be very precise in order to actually drive the metabolic economy. Um, rhythms, obviously, very fast, are very can be very versatile in they can be interacting to promote intra and intracellular communication. And to see that, we basically had to develop a lot of technology. We had to reach into data scientists to help us to 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 help us understand what is going on, and that to see how complex is all these biological complica uh, uh, complications that actually can make pancreas uh, kind of like very optimized agent in governing um, everything metabolic, what is going on in our organism. And with this, I would thank you for your attention, and I'm. Happy to answer questions after the uh, Mr. Popper's lecture. Thank you. Marian, thank you for a very deep and thorough lecture. And uh, I think we will have questions at the end of both lectures. Uh, now I'd like just to make something very simple. You know, you mentioned uh, how many uh, hormones we have to, to take care of high glucose, and it is like bringing goods to uh, a shop, you know, and insulin is maybe a currency that can bring this stuff to people and back home. So insulin is necessary to get glucose into the cell. And the other thing you mentioned, these small islets with beta cells that are spread over pancreas. So maybe this reminds me in the beginning of this lecture, uh, when we are talking about different cultures, each islet can have a different culture, but in the way they have to work together somehow to make um, the system work properly. Like the whole universe, not the whole universe, but <laughs> the whole planet should work in harmony to live in harmony. So uh, Violeta, I think it's now time that you introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ernst Pöppel is Professor Emeritus of Medical Psychology at the University of Munich, where he still works today. At the beginning of his exceptional career during his activity at the prestigious institute MIT in Cambridge in America, where he worked several years, he discovered a phenomenon known as blind sight. After brilliant studies and researches, due to his interdisciplinary profile, he was asked to join as board member of the National Research Center Jülich in Germany. Here he founded uh, centers for the neurosciences, environmental research, and mathematical modeling. Then he founded 
the Human Science Center at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, an interdisciplinary center with some thousand members worldwide. He has supervised more than 200 doctoral students from more than 40 countries, and he has published more than 300 scientific papers and some 10 books for the general public. His research focuses mainly on temporal processing, visual perception, and theoretical issues. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences Leopoldinus, also in Germany. And he is also a member of uh, our academy. He received numerous awards, like honorary doctor's degrees and so on. On a personal note, being a victim of World War II and becoming a refugee, Ernst Pöppel became his political uh, motto. Scientists are natural ambassadors, he says. Scientists are the only ones who independent of external constraints, religion, history, social systems, financial opportunities, or else pursue the path to understand the world around us and the world within us. So I'm very happy to, to invite Ernst Pepe, yeah, to bring us in the cosmos of our own brain, our own body. Thank you very much for your introduction. Now comes the most difficult part of the presentation to uh, create the PowerPoint. How are we doing? Can you see a, a, a picture on the screen? Yes, we can see, we can see. It's perfect. Okay. So coming from Munich, uh, it is, uh, um, I would say, even necessary to show this picture of the human brain, which was uh, by, drawn by Corbinian Brodmann many, many years ago. He also worked in Munich. And what we see here, uh, it's actually, this picture is in every textbook in psychology and neuroscience, so that uh, the different areas process um, different informations, like on the right side, area 17, an area which I dedicated most of my efforts is visual processing, or the frontal lobe to the left, 40% of the brain, uh, which uh, is still, let's see, terra incognita. So this is just background information. Now, um, what's going on in the system? Um, this is a picture by Ramoni Cajal. Um, I think maybe we can say that Cajal got the Nobel Prize in 1906 for this uh, 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 picture, I would say. Uh, so there are more than 100 million, 100 billion nerve cells. And uh, um, my presentation, by the way, will have some kind of, let's say, uh, philosophical, uh, impl not, not implications, but let's say associations. So one of the most challenging question I think we have in our field is, uh, how is it possible that in a system with more than 100 billion elements, um, there's something like an identity of something as something? So uh, how becomes an object an object, or that we see a face as a face, and so on, a thought, a thought, a melody, a melody, a being always one in a certain moment. So this is the identity question, which to the best of my knowledge is not solved in philosophy or in our field of cognitive neuroscience or psychology. Now, with this picture here, 
uh, I want to explain, and I will spend a few time on this, uh, basic principles of neural processing. And I follow here um, basically a lecture series I experienced when I was at MIT by Professor Valenauta. And uh, I still think that he is one of the greatest neuroanatomists of the last century. So what we have to um, dis distinguish are three types of nerve cells. By the way, I'm going to talk on a very abstract level. Um, so three types of nerve cells are receptors. These are the antenna that reach out into the world um, and sort of give us information in the visual domain, in the auditory, olfactory, to olfactory domain, and so on. So an interesting point here is, I think, you has to realize that these antenna, these receptors, uh, have different transduction times on the surface. So the antenna have different time constants. For the visual system, for instance, it takes under optimal conditions something like 25 to 30 milliseconds that something is transduced to become a neural signal to be then brought to the cortical surface, for instance. In the auditory system, it's much shorter. It's less than a millisecond. Now, here comes already a riddle. Uh, unfortunately, we are not in the same room right now, only in the virtual room. But just imagine you're sitting in a room and talk to somebody, and the person is next, is close to you. Then the auditory information of that person close to you reaches uh, your brain 25 to 30 milliseconds earlier than you see the person. Only around actually 10 to 12 meter corresponds to the uh, sound traveling time uh, to the transduction time in the human retina. So at 10, 12 meter, we have a horizon of simultaneity. Beyond that, auditory information comes later. Now, this not only applies to humans, by the way, of course, but uh, all animals that have sense organs like we. So this is a challenge um, for the brain, how to deal with this problem. And uh, picking up an idea from the last lecture, one answer is oscillations. Um, nobody experienced probably that something arrives earlier in the auditory and later in the visual domain. So what Mother Nature has done, Mother Nature has invented neural oscillations in the frequency domain of some 40 hertz. So let's say 25 to 30 milliseconds a periodic length. And uh, so stimuli initiate an oscillations, mathematically speaking, relaxation oscillations and not pendulum oscillations. And each of the period oscillation is an elementary processing unit within which information is treated as co-temporal. So the trick of Mother Nature has been to step out of the continuity of physical time, according to, let's say, Newton's physics, a continuity of time, and actually create time zones or time windows within which information is treated it's co-temporal, it's uh, being at one time. So on these segments of 30, 40 milliseconds then follow each other. I come to this point later, uh, if I ever should come to the end of my talk. The second type of neurons are the motor neurons. Whereas we have some several hundred million um, sensory neurons, visual, auditory, and so on, olfactory quite a lot. Motor neurons, only a few million. So the motor neurons serve the purpose that we can control our, let's say, speech, movements, internal organs. So that's the output system. Now let me 
draw your attention to the great intermediate net, as it can be called, that is the, the neurons that have during evolution developed between receptors and motor neurons. As Wallenauter always stressed in his lectures and also in the written form, in the early evolution, there were neurons which were at the same time receptors and motor neurons. Then came a, a great discovery and they were separated, receptors and motor neurons. And they communicated the synaptic context being either excitatory or inhibitory. And then the great intermediate net developed bit, between these two types. And for these, for this great intermediate net, let's call it just the brain, yes? three types of the three concepts are necessary for a better understanding how we function or maybe how we do not function. So at first, an anatomical principle. Every neuron sends information to some 10,000 others. So there is a divergence of projection. Every circle here represents one neuron, one of the hundred billions. Divergence of projection means that 10 other 10,000 other neurons get local information. For geometric reasons, one has to understand then that every neuron gets input from some 10,000 neurons. Now, uh, excuse me, excuse me. And look, I receive following information. Liebe Violetta, er zeigt den falschen Bildschirm mit seinen Notizen. What? But I don't think so. Mm -hmm. It is of information, but I don't know. That I was, just that wanted. Was, that was the previous lecture. Oh, excuse me. Excuse yeah, me. Everything's all right. Yeah. Uh, but I have another problem right now with my computer. It's starting to cook. I don't know if it's the heating. I don't know what to do right now. Maybe I should put it in something that the. Uh, well. Well, if, if it blows up, you know that was my computer, not myself. Uh, so um, I just mentioned that every neuron gets input from many, many others, 10,000. Yeah? Well, let, let's do a little bit mathematics. Um, let's say it's not all, it's not 10,000, it's just 100 neurons, 100, in, 100 inputs, which are independent of each other. Then how many potential functional states does one neuron have? Well, it's two power 100 minus one. So that is the same as 10 to the 30, 30 the exponent. So a one with 30 zeros. Well, any data scientist will tell you that's, that's that you cannot compute that. Yeah? That's just too much. Uh, and, and so the functional state of a neuron can actually not be computed. And that means, to use it as a metaphor, and this applies to every neuron, that our internal states, uh, because of the anatomy, is incomputable. We are, uh, I don't want to miss now the English word, unberechenbar. We cannot, we cannot be predicted. Yeah? Of course, we believe we can do that, but there is some kind of limits of control um, this is actually a fundamental principle we have to understand. So this, this was the idea about anatomy. Now, how do neurons talk to each other? Well, as I mentioned already, they have excitatory or inhibitory transmitters. So if one neuron is active, the next one is ex excited or inhibited. I will not go into this detail not right now because I want to make another point, which psychologically, I think, is most important and even philosophically important. We ask the question, what is actually the maximal di distance between any neuron from any other neuron in the human brain? As shown in the first picture by Boltzmann. How many steps in between have to be activated or inhibited to bring this local information anywhere? 
And the answer is only about four steps in between. Uh, actually, when I say that a large amount of divergence of projection, we cannot com uh, compute already that it must be very close distance. Usually medical students at Munich University did not understand that. So I made the following observational remark. Just imagine you are a neuron. And uh, now every other person knows everybody you know. And through you, I know everybody you know. So once I was in the Orinoco and met some Indios there, and another time I met Dr. Angela Merkel, the German chancellor. So the German chancellor is just one intermediate neuron myself away from Indios in the uh, Orinoco area. So the, there's an amazing uh, similarity or closeness between people on the globe. And this brings us to the metaphor that borders are necessary to somehow have local information. But without borders, we would have a class. Maybe that applies also, of course, then in the two political domain. So uh, what is the consequence of this, what I just described? If everything is closely connected, that means that we have no independence of any function activity. So that it's so, so narrow uh, what is going on in our brain. I just check my time because the temple organization is very critical. I think I probably jumped over this. Well, I can just simply remark it. Uh, that one of my academic teachers actually was Konrad Lorenz from Vienna, right? Now, and uh, uh, he, he brought up the concept of imprinting. So the connectivity in the brain, which I was just referring to, um, is somehow selected during first phases, so critical phases in life. Um, and so that the, the early phase, we have a gigantic amount of genetic possibilities but the physical and the cultural environment uh, somehow confirms only a partial set. And so we create reference systems for information systems, which applies also to belief and value systems. Uh, so uh, uh, in the previous talk, it was also referred to, to pain, for instance, eating, speech, and so on. This is somehow a machinery that is imprinted during early phases and modern epigenetics, of course, works intensely exactly on this problem. Now, just a quick uh, idea here, um, also referring to medicine. With this very simple, very simple uh, graph uh, of how brains function, we can actually describe quickly different diseases, uh, problems we have in information processing. So A, for instance, receptors may miss, may missing on the mot motoric cell, Maybe in ALS, we cannot control our muscles anymore. Or what else do we have? See, that the, the balance between excitation and inhibition, let's say, in the temporal cortex, like in epilepsy, for instance, or depression uh, goes away. Or we have uh, multiple, multiple sclerosis, the connection is disturbed. Or in F here, after stroke, for instance, um, we have some kind of loss of function. And I want to mention this. Our field um, is mainly characterized by loss of function. Uh, if one has a monistic point of view towards how we function, not a dualistic, but monistic, pragmatic monism, um, we argue that the loss of a function is a proof of its existence. This is how the work in neuropsychology, psychiatry, neurology has developed since basically 1864 with uh, Paul Brocher in Paris. So to repeat this, the loss of a function is a proof of its existence. And now there's perhaps one more point um, I should mention here with respect to this area F, uh, we have the loss of a bigger area. 
there's a very interesting observation that uh, going back to Carl Lashley, for instance, that there's an equipotentiality of neurons. So within a net, we can lose many neurons, but there's still some kind of mass action available. The neurons have equipotential uh, power. Okay, now let's move on. Now this picture here is in a certain sense, the same picture I showed in the beginning with the brain. This is how one can look at the brain as well. And uh, so uh, what we um, are doing to repeat this, we pick up information, stimuli, shown here as visual, auditory, tactile. And we have a R, a response, a reaction, a representation of the world. Now, what's going on in between? What I show here are simple boxes and areas A, B, C, D that represent different domains of information processing, like uh, per perceiving, processing, acting. Um, and what we know from neuropsychological observation, and also on the basis of modern research with functional MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, that at any moment, while you listen to me, in case you listen to me, there's a multiple distributed activity in many areas of the brain. And what I said before, um, that actually this simultaneous activity raises a tremendous problem. Um, how do we unify that? How, do, how can we create an identity of a percept? Uh, so we need some kind of logistic machinery. And uh, so what I'm trying to convey here is a basic principle of representation of knowledge that we have content functions like percepts, memories, uh, volitions, language, motor programs, decisions. This is the content, the what functions. And they are represented here by the little black boxes. But at the same time, at any moment, we have activity in many different areas. So they have to be interconnected. And so what we have is a temporal organization between these domains, and this is indicated with these arrows, a synchronization actually somehow relates to the previous talk also, how they did talk to each other. And what uh, Mother Nature has discovered, and I repeat this here, there is some kind of high level machinery and the domain of 40 Hertz that creates some kind of unity of function. But we need also a power supply, which is indicated here by activation. And we have long-term modulation, uh, like here, by, like by the circadian rhythm. Now, the domain of, let's say, 30, 40 milliseconds to create elementary processing units is just one thing. But there's another temporal domain, which seems to be, I think, quite important, and which is much longer. It's in the domain of two to three seconds. Two to three seconds is something like the subjective present or the subject of the noun is. If you come from physics, you know that the concept of a now does not exist in physics. Uh, so we have also a language problem when we talk about we talk about the subjective present according to the uh, Augustinus, the philosopher. In the year 397-98 he published Confessionis, Confessions. And the eleventh book of uh, confessions is probably still the best book about temple processing. And he says, there's only the present. Yeah? The past is uh, memoria, future is expectation. So our task is what is actually the present? So with, a, let's say, paradigms, in electrophysiology, psychophysics, we have described this present as a two to three second time window. And this expresses itself in many activities. Uh, um, and I want to give you all, only one example because um, uh, we are somehow uh, trying to bring art and science together. When we listen, when you listen to me, in case you do this, you probably observe 
that my utterances are always about two, three seconds. Then comes a planning pause of 500 or so milliseconds, sometimes bridged by paralinguistic vocalizations. Then comes the next utterance. So time is segmented. Yeah? They're connected uh, by cement semantic connection between the content of them. Now, it just happens that this three second time window can be nicely observed in music. We did some studies looking into the brain and taking, for instance, let's say in the tradition of uh, uh, Viennese, uh, the tradition Haydn and Tomala, yeah, um, that you observe quite often the duration of your musical motive is roughly about three seconds. We studied in detail the Flying Dutchman motive. I'm not going to sing this right now. And what we did actually, we compressed or extended the duration of the motive for Flying Dutchman of Richard Wagner, and then looking at the brain activation. And we observed that there's a much higher activation uh, if this motive fits into the three second time window. Shorter or longer, it somehow spoils the aesthetic appreciation. So this is just one example. I could give many more, but there's another example in poetry. When you go to poetry and listen to the, let's say, duration of the verse length, uh, then you will observe that in, we have studied about 20 languages, that the duration of a verse length is roughly two seconds. So the example is Sonnet 18 by Shakespeare. Now look at your watches. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaves have all too short a day. So that is automatically, it's fit, it fits into, it's like a clock in our brain. Uh, if you want to, if you have less syllables, not 10, 12, but less syllables, you automatically speak a little slower. C'est bien la pire peine de ne savoir pourquoi. Sans amour et sans haine, mon cœur attend de peine. By Verlaine, I think one of the best description of this depression. This also applies then to the examiner, uh, Alexandrina, which I think is the word. So there's a direct representation of brain activity, which we measure with other technology, and the aesthetic, the, the world, let's say, of aesthetic appreciation. So let's move on from this now here. And uh, so I repeat this, what I've said before. There is no percept without memory reference. There is no emotion without perceptual reference. There are no volition without emotional reference. We are misled, particularly in the Western tradition, by words. So that you know there's something like consciousness, so there's something like emotion. There are states of that, but to have a noun for that is misleading. So we have to somehow reflect this in a different way. All this, what I've described, is of course, within the context of Theodosius Dabchansky. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, and it applies, of course, to ourselves. And that means we are victims of ourselves because of our evolutionary uh, tradition. We cannot escape ourselves. Um, so uh, I'm trying to jump over this. This is, uh, I'm looking in parallel. To the watch, Violetta, don't worry, I'm, I'm finishing quickly. Um, all of us have, have said on principles of inv information processing not only applies to organisms with brains, but also with organisms, the unicellular organisms. And here's Gunyaudax polyedra, which has been studied by a colleague, for instance, in our institute in Munich, by Phil Renneberg, on looking for circadian rhythms. But you can show the unicellular organisms have the same cognitive machinery, they have percepts, categories, they compare things to the choice, they all move somewhere where it's better. Uh, but I have, because of time limits, I do not go to this. I will jump over this and just come to the end. We are victims in a certain sense of ourselves because we always think about knowing 
we refer to AI, for instance, of explicit knowledge. But there is something like implicit, tacit knowledge, ritual knowledge, and of course, pictorial knowledge. We are sensory, we are visual animals that pick up the world. And uh, what is the, are the unifying principles of the different modes of knowledge, explicit, explicit word, implicit knowledge, and pictorial, well, it's always reflecting uh, something as something to the mimetic principle. And um, if somebody is interested, we have written about this, the aesthetic principle is the uh, same thing. I jump over. Well, this is just an example of blind sight. I was introduced with blind sight that patients process information when they are blind with the dark areas here, although they do not see it. So it's a direct proof of implicit knowledge. And uh, so Claude Bernard, we can. So I come to the end. The fundamental philosophical sentences. Nil is generation, nothing is without reason. We are victims of ourselves because we often believe that is without one reason. And I'm very, very happy that I've invented the disease. I have called it monocausalitis. And uh, nothing like that, particularly when it comes to med medicine, is, has only one reason. So, the principle of William of Ockham, yeah, who actually passed away in Munich, Ockham's razor, that the simplest explanation, the monocausal uh, 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 explanation is the correct one. It's wrong. The simplest exp explanation should be accepted. No, it could be different. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for your brilliant. I, I did this. Yeah, I put my my alarm clock to that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for your brilliant presentation. I would like to ask Dushan to conduct now uh, the next part, which are the commentary asking and please, Dushan. Well, I gave one commentary to Marian talk about insulin that is actually providing glucose to the cells and also connecting somehow in cultures of uh, beta cell isolates working together uh, to produce the right amount of insulin secreted. Uh, and there should be some communication between these isolates could be that could be, represent different cultures. Uh, now, uh, I enjoyed the second lecture very much too. Uh, what uh, I'd like to say that I like your quotation of Claude Bernard because nowadays he would not be respected as a scientist. He was doing so many things, not in one line, but I think he, he really made a big impact on the whole life sciences uh, with homostasis and so on. Uh, well, uh, I think that now we could have both sessions open to questions. If there's no other question, then I will inter intervene because I have many questions, but we don't have a lot of time. Please. So uh, maybe uh, I uh, I could ask uh, Professor Pepper. Uh, you showed how we are somehow fixed into three seconds time frame, which would be now and nothing else exists. And you also said that somehow we are uh, unpredictable because there are so many neurons with so many connections that we could never be predicted. But we know that many people are very predictable. Uh, that's one thing and maybe could you comment on uh, inhibition? And you know, there are from at least two uh, points, one from electrophysiology, one from MRI, showing that all we can do, that all the control we have is to say no. You know, some motions or thoughts or uh, inspirations appear spontaneously. And 
all that we can decide is to say, no, I don't want to go there that way. We stop. So Bereit's potential, that was the first time uh, that was, uh, it appeared. But uh, this can be seen in many other um, experimental conditions. How could you comment that? Yeah, that's a very important point, of course. The Bereitschaft potential is, uh, was a start with uh, what Count Huber and these people do uh, discuss this. Um, I think what we have to understand is the different time constants in these systems uh, and uh, that uh, indeed uh, the, in the discussion of the so-called free will, yeah, that is sort of the, the point that uh, we are capable to, to, to say no. Um, um, but um, um, we, at, at any decision, be it in a three second time world or any time after something has been done, we do not have access to the parameters that actually have def has uh, make that decision, yeah? a decision is uh, on the on the on the super superficial level. We believe we have control, but we are we are suffering from the illusion of control. We simply do not know that. Yeah. Um, so then, unfortunately, or fortunately, we have to enter the social domain, right? So we are embedded in a social environment, yeah, and we adapt. Um, certain behavioral patterns to that, and so that the knowness uh, fits nicely into this here. But I, I want to stress: is uh, any um, any decision uh, is um, um, not implausible. It's it's uh, it's um, not transparent. It's in, it's not transparent. Uh, but now, so not the question: Do we have any responsibility if we have no control? No, we don't have any. No. No, we are controlled from outside yeah, as a, because we are embedded in social systems. Yeah. But we have no, there's no chance. Yeah. That is uh, just, this is just uh, a reality from a point of view of a neuroscientist with strong prejudices, as you may feel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are mostly in science, but we move now to philosophy. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I think we have to. We have the. We have to be forced. Yeah to follow also the potential trajectories of conclusions as they are given by our field. Yeah? Uh, and so uh, I did not spend too much time on, on uh, the economical principle of decision processes. The one point is, and I saw the pyramid, easy access to information processing, effortless processing, is essential to have efficient action here, yeah? three E's. That's, uh, and, and so we, our evolutionary principle is to be fast. Yeah. And this results also in the monocausal uh, uh, interpretations. That is sort of one yeah, yeah. problem, you problem we have to deal with. Yeah. You showed a beautiful picture of Agonia Lux, which is actually a very toxic <laughs> living <laughs> being, producing so many uh, toxins that are harmful. You know, if, if you ingest some marine food, you can get killed by, by this beautiful uh, living being. And uh, I, I'll now move to Marian because uh, we also have a similarity. You know, beta cells are also somehow controlled by environment, what you mentioned for our mind. So there's a similarity with a very simple thing without uh, within our bodies and our mind, which is, of course, much more complex. But we, we see the same pattern appearing in nature uh, from dinoflagellates that you showed is going to look and uh, higher being it's just getting more and more complex but the principle i think it's more or less the same yes i i would fully agree with that i mean if maybe i would hear uh, president proper purpose lecture before i would also mention that the at physiological stimulation of beta cells the typical wavelength is about two to three seconds which is which <laughs> Which is very yeah. interesting. So, I mean, mostly, mostly when we study beta cells, we overstimulate them. We actually push them into something which would be similar to kind of like a, a, a grand mal, kind of like epileptic activity. So, it's not much physiology there. But if you use physiological stimulation, basically, we have this very typical, you know, peak at at that at that frequency. And I often, often, I mean, the reason I I used to be in neuroscience before, but basically I, I stick to beta cells simply because uh, they, at a certain point, they become very exciting too, because, you know, we have very small organ, 
we have like a unit, you know, unitary, uh, there are just a few hundreds of cells that actually they can do a lot of computation that, that it's practically impossible to study within the brain because the collectives becomes too big to, to study them with the current technology that we have. But we can see all the cells in our, in our system and actually can appreciate some of the natural laws that actually appear there. Just as a comment here also, I think please tell us, and St. Andrew's shown that the NMDA receptor has also some kind of temporal fluctuation, the two to three, two or three seconds approximately. Yeah. <laughs> Which is expressed in beta cells too, so yeah. <laughs> we cannot avoid I that. <laughs> send, send me the, the information, please, about this. Yeah. About NMDA receptors in beta cells? Oh, well, you, what you have done. In, in, so there's two or three seconds in your, in your field, yeah? Yeah, sure, 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 I will do. Yeah, I think uh, Violetta has my my email. Yeah. I think we 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 she sent us both the 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 the, the emails uh, yeah, yeah, together, right. so I, I can yeah. actually use oh, yeah, that. Yeah. Ah, why? Well, because you mentioned me. I just want to ask you something, uh, dear Ernst. Uh, you speak about monocausalities, and I feel so deep in my thoughts the uh, the reason of this. Uh, interesting notion and i would like to uh, ask you if it could be um, compared or, or could have a relation with uh, a theory of catastrophe la théorie de la catastrophe de rené tom uh, because this idea to have an impulse at the very beginning with a um, um, a process which can bring uh, in other dimensions it's something also possible to apply psychological and also in the musical form. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you this. Yeah, Violetta, I cannot comment on this. I I, I never thought about this. It's, it's, it's a good point, yeah. <laughs> uh, to, to also think in that direction, but I cannot, I don't know. So. Uh, it's not a scientific thought about, but uh, we all of us we have in our history in our life's history moments when we can say this is the causality for what happened 20 years later and the musical form we have also such processes and we can also understand music of middle ages and also music uh, constructed with uh, uh, idea of uh, theory of catastrophe <laughs> so that's why but um, anyway it's a we have a complex uh, uh, world in our mind, and uh, you are the one who can help to find a way to understand this labyrinth. Yeah, it seems that everything in our life is frequency and amplitude modulated. Even if you go to painting, you know, different frequencies are, uh, can be translated to different wavelengths of colors and so on. It's uh, the whole world is actually somehow frequency modulated and uh, we are just part of it. So we should not be uh, surprised by, by the fact, you know, it's... Um, but I think for me, the, the principal question is actually, what is the function, the, the reason of oscillations? Um, is it, uh, let it take the Bernard principle of homeostasis. Can we reach homeostatic states only by using oscillations that somehow may maintain an equilibrium. So it's actually it can, generally. actually can, because if you don't, uh, if you miss uh, the correct intervention in frequency, you can get uh, negative, uh, not negative feedback, but positive feedback. That's uh, actually the basis of oscillations. And uh, in the end you have, uh, let's say uh, at the end of life, you can have this type of breathing, which is uh, combining apnea with uh, hyperpnea, leading to death at the end. It's just because this frequency mismatch produces such uh, such an outcome. You know, you don't have a nice frequency, but you have um, high peaks of uh, so very high amplitudes of some frequencies and missing some frequencies completely. I think it is actually, uh, it fits into Claude Bernard homeostasis principle. You know, if you, if you modulate, you have to have the same frequency of response. 
to have a negative feedback. And if it doesn't fit in the uh, in the right wavelengths, you'll get high peaks and yeah. Uh, I think well, just as a side remark, I don't know whether Professor Merrow is still here uh, in our group. Uh, I've done yes, I see Marta Merrow is. Uh... Yeah, there she is. Yeah, uh, when I was a young scientist and doing these bunker experiments. I uh, observed actually a beat phenomena in kidney functions that uh, at the same time a subject was synchronized with the arrest activity cycle uh, to a, a group of other subjects in the bunker experiment. But uh, uh, the, uh, at the same time, the vegetative function, body, uh, regulation of body temperature and kidney function, excretion of sodium, potassium, and so were uh, running in a different frequency. And the two superimposed and created actually a beat phenomenon, uh, which uh, uh, unfortunately was not picked up by the circadian community as a phenomenon. I think it's too hard. It was too hard to, to uh, study in humans because not every human did it the same way. But we've seen it uh, since then. When you look at enough data, you see it in other complex system, other circadian clock systems too. But no, it has not been solved per se. It certainly has to do with coupled oscillators and how they synchronize to one another. Okay. Any other question? If not, Violeta, I'm giving the floor back to you. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think uh, the idea is to get together and I'm sure that uh, uh, you have questions and uh, I don't dare to ask directly somebody, but uh, I, I would like to ask you, uh, uh, yeah, to follow your thoughts and uh, to bring us questions. Because as we know, questions are always possible. Uh, they are always necessary and good. <laughs> um, if not, I can myself uh, ask both of you if you could I, I i mean marianne and also ernst if we could tell us in your scientific words if it is possible for us to understand um, what happens with our reactions in the moment when we we are informed about things we do not know um, I think in our times we have a big problem because uh, we are uh, all the time in the situation that we receive information we, which we could not, cannot control. And what is possible, how is it possible in our time to make a, a decision after trying to understand or to feel what happens in the world? We spoke at the very beginning uh, about human rights, so it is also possible to to find a, a main idea in order to for, uh, to try to answer my strange question. Well, if the colleague does not start to talk, because you uh, <laughs> um, every every decision is wrong, um, because there always could be a better one, but we do not know that in advance. So um, no decision is the worst. So it has to it has to be done, and then retrospectively we may, may perhaps understand the causality. That is uh, um, uh, that modern times uh, times uh, have always been critical. And how do we react? Yeah, yeah that is uh, it's a political, philosophical, and so on question. And I think that is uh, my, my personal choice would be actually that uh, you we maintain, and this was expressed with the um, the motto I have, yeah, scientists are natural ambassadors. And I think uh, uh, what the academy is doing is exactly that, bringing people from different cultures together. And I have initiated at, uh, schools, with, uh, online schools, winter and autumn school. We just had an autumn school with subjects, uh, students from 10 different cultures, working on, um, in this case, um, the topic was balances, uh, balanced uh, 
sustainability in a changing world, that people, young people, well, and then of all ages work together. And if they do it, they get to know each other. And uh, my hope uh, in prediction would be then they do not shoot at each other when they work together. So that's sort of the, the political program um, of scientists and natural ambassadors. Thank you. You know, uh, the old mythology uh, tells us also old uh, fairy tales. What happens when we are uh, we are uh, in a, sp a special moment at a crossroad? Which direction do, can we take? And uh, if it is Im it is impo important to know what happens, just to know realities and to know histories, and then we know as much as possible in order to decide at the crossroad in which direction we can go. So I think it's a, it's a old question people are trying to answer for a very, very long time. And as... Maybe if I just can add a little bit, I mean, I also alluded about that uh, on that on or during my talk. I mean, as immune system and uh, the digestive system or metabolic system doesn't know, what is coming there always is something which is unpredictable coming to them and they there's no decision they can make they practically improvise they improvise but they know that basically that there's no kind of like as you say they are this strong reaction like shooting you know if you don't agree or something like this you know very strong immune response actually can fly back you know and that that's 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 why you 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 actually react you have to react but but in a way not too strongly. You try to to not to react too strongly to to a novel novel stimulus in your environment. But there's no there there's no such a optimal pathway from the from the fairy tales. There's always a hero who actually makes the right choice. But I think this is only statistical. <laughs> you cannot always make a right choice. Yeah. yeah but talking about immune system, just going a couple of years back, you now it's COVID. It's like. Um, panic immune system panicked and produced too much cytokines and people died of that yeah. so it's the same in populations you know when you react in panic you make damage more than uh, uh, the causative agent would cause by itself and uh, i think your question violetta was quite uh, important but i i doubt that anybody can give an answer because we are asking this question for said for thousands of years and uh, I think everybody has to find a right answer at the right time for himself. You are right. When I think about, for example, res uh, what happens in the brain of re really researchers, mathematicians, for example, they have an idea, you know, but they don't know if it is true. And it is possible that two years, one year, 10 years, they are working on this idea in order to try to demonstrate. It's not like in music, you are doing your melody. No, no, they have to have to demonstrate that the idea uh, is possible to demonstrate. You know? And that means in such a situation, they are below, they have a, a strong uh, quality. I mean, strong information, they are really scientists. And the second aspect, they have a very strong instinct. But it is always a big adventure. They are having an, a strong idea and they never know if it is possible to, to demonstrate it because not possible to demonstrate in one moment. Maybe the, the really genies, they can see at the same time uh, the idea and the demonstration long way. So I suppose that if we think about each of us has his own context in which we can decide ourselves to, to try to answer this question, I, I mean. But nowadays we are in a society and we are in a world in which we at the same time receive information for all over. And if we have enough time, we can we can have a big a big storage of information and this is a new situation when comparison with another centuries or 10 years ago or 20 years ago and this is a question um if there is any possibility from you the one who are uh, trying to understand our brain <laughs> to, to give us a little window where we can have a, a nice seat as well I, I'm not, uh, I would not like be the only one who 
Uh, well, the, the, the one window is, of course, an um, uh, invitation to modesty from our brain science point of view. I think Professor Hermann wants to say something. Yeah, I want to underline this question by reformulating it. Uh, what do we do or how can we avoid that we pretend to ourselves and others that we know everything? Uh, you mentioned the pandemics before, and when we have been surprised by it, we always have had some explanation. Even if it was a wrong one, we, we made ourselves convinced this is the explanation, this is from where it comes. And we have this in a political situation now, we have it when it comes to AI. Um, there's always this image, uh, dystopia or, or utopia or whatever, and how can we convince ourselves and others uh, to question this. You mentioned earlier you, you make uh, courses uh, with international students, uh, confronting them with difference. Uh, Daniel Barenboim and uh, Edward uh, Seid do the same with this uh, East Western, Western Eastern uh, uh, um, Orchestra uh, to confront people from different experiences, different backgrounds, uh, and question themselves. So how can we support this possibly on a wider scale, in a wider uh, area, not only working with individuals? I think we have to learn that we have prejudices. I think that is, um, I think one person says, I don't have prejudices. It is exactly a prejudice. I just would like to project ourselves back 400 years. When Francis Bacon in Novum Organum wrote, that in the beginning, actually, for modern science, there are four mistakes we are making. Uh, mistake number one, we have our evolutionary heritage, right? We are humans. Uh, I, I was trying to explain this unpredictability, right? We have individual imprinting, yeah? which do I make mistakes and see, I have only own, our own perspective. A big problem is for me in my scientific work is a translation of thinking to language. There is a, not an isomorphic mapping of what we think into language. And uh, this is just a, a disaster. And number four, Francis Bacon said, we have prejudices. And the understanding why we have it in order to how it be fast, there are many reasons why we have it for a more efficient, effective, effective, efficient processing. And that we have to learn that everybody is sort of dominated by prejudices and that we have better know what they are. And then in the discourse, I'm going to discuss old Roman uh, law, audiato et altera pars, listen to the other person, listen to what he or she is saying. That is, uh, I think, maybe even an academic program. A couple of times we came to artificial intelligence and uh, big data and the later said that uh, now we have so many information that uh, this should somehow improve uh, our ability to decide what to how to react but uh, i have some doubts you know because especially with artificial intelligence at this moment it's taking everything as gold wrong and right it doesn't discriminate and uh, I often remember uh, when I was in gymnasium, I had a teacher of mathematics and many people hated him because he gave so many data to solve a problem that people stopped because they didn't know which data to choose to solve the problem. You know, that, so a large number of data uh, can make uh, decisions more difficult and many, many data are not relevant. And uh, now I ask myself, uh, am I thinking that some data are not relevant because I have prejudices? What do you think? I cannot answer your question. No. <laughs> but because we do not know. <laughs> How yeah. can we know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have always retro retrospective yeah. causality attribution. I think this is what we're doing. Yeah. By the way, I think I, what I really enjoy is to, to fight with chat, chat GPT. I'm always inventing now in communication new words that do not exist 
<laughs> in my language, in English or German. And they are understood by other people when, when I send in an SMS. Their words, you understand <laughs> it immediately, but they don't exist. So no. I wonder how ChatGPT is going to deal with that problem. Oh, that's... <laughs> May I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So um, uh, this is something for both Marianne and Ernst. Um, Ernst, I think one of the most outrageous things you said um, and I can't believe no one has called you on this yet, is that goniolax has cognition. And by your definition, I think that also the pancreas would have cognition. And so I wanted to know, um, I wanted to sort of get this discussion going, Marianne, do you think the, pan the do you, do you, is that an attractive idea to you with all the functions that you've described in the pancreas and that you know about in the pancreas and Ernst, how can you, um, if the if the goniolax has cognition, what cell on earth does not have cognition? That's exactly the point. I think that I'm not the only one actually who, I did not say cognition, but cognitive principle that Cog cognitive. Char characterize mm -hmm. us. So uh, uh, in, in goniolax, I think mm -hmm. you know that uh, there are receptors on the surface. Yes. Sensitive for long and short wavelength, yeah. So mm -hmm. it's called a vision, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and and these guys have a so, show social competence. They unify then in, in nice uh, social patterns. Uh, I, I do not want to go through the details right now. I think the, the the principles of categorization, comparison, a time constant, uh, always to go somewhere according to the homeostatic principle where it's good. Yeah. So you measure all the time the status of your environment. Mm -hmm. All that applies also to creatures with brains. So mm -hmm. I find this fantastic that the physical constraints of the world yeah, in order to make life possible are practically identical. The only thing is that you can say, oh, humans have theory of mind. They can somehow like, uh, transport themselves in the cognitive system of the others. But I think um, apes have also theory of mind. Yeah? So it's, it's just a quantitative difference perhaps. So mm -hmm. I think this is, a, this is a nice thing to have this unifying principle of life uh, on the globe. Yeah? And it's physics, it's a physical uh -huh. principle that uh, somehow selected yeah, and, and sort of uh, uh, defined the constraint of, of um, evolutionary environments. Uh, regarding pancreas and sort of cognitive princi principles in pancreas, I understand pancreas primarily from the sensory point of view. So it's not just that it has to blindly release insulin because we heard that the insulin is, is pretty dangerous if you actually release too much. So you have to be very smart in how, in how to actually compute out the, what you have to compute. And I would understand the sensory systems in a way that they know what is their optimal stimulus. If they don't get optimal stimulation, they are actually out of order. It's like if you have a cataract, your photoreceptors will get damaged. And if your blood pancreatic beta cells don't get proper information due to kind of like wrong dietary patterns or something like this, they will actually start to drift genetically, epigenetically somewhere. It will all correlate with disease, but it will have no causality to disease. You know, that's our problem, you know, because molecular biology is very strong. It can detect minute differences in thousands and thousands of genes, which can all together be just a consequence of wrong stimulation. You may have a problem with perfusion of the pancreas, which will lead to changes of the pancreas. So this is part of the cognition principle is that beta cells, they understand what is their normal principle. What is their normal range where they actually operate and, 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 and they respond adequately. I mean, this is one paper that, that I, I like to cite whenever I write some theory on that is, is also author is Daniel Dennett. Uh, together with uh, My Michael Lewin, biologist, you know, they have these worms that they actually, where they cut half and then they regrow the missing part. Yeah. But they can reprogram that. And this can also happen in, in nature with kind of like infection, the bacterial infection of those worms. So they actually lose the polar the proper polarity due to changes, you know. But you will only know that something re get re got reprogrammed if you cut the worm. The worm can live normally until the end of the life. There is no molecular changes. There is no epigenetic changes that you would detect. But if you cut the worm, the tail will grow tail and not the head. 
Yeah, and that means that we have a possibility that even in the disease related to our organs, like pancreas, there might be changes in the reprogramming, which will only become apparent when actually you uh, you stress the, the pancreas to a certain point, like cut it or whatever damage you can do to that, and only then, and then whatever molecular you know snapshot you will take at that time, it have it will have no correlation to no causality to why it happens because it may be the the, the whole principle the whole evil event actually happened 30 years ago, which has no signature, you know, it, only if, if you actually are injured, then you will actually get the phenotype, otherwise there is no way. And, and this is not a cognition in terms of how we normally would imagine it using our brain, but if there are some similar principles, of course. Mm -hmm. Exactly, there are some similar principles indeed. Thank you so much for both of these lectures, it was really, really very enjoyable. Yeah, thank you, really. It was a pleasure to listen and to discuss. Yolita, now it's up Thank to you so much also. We have a, a, a wonderful beginning of our winter semester and uh, we hope you are coming again because in fact, the discussion are also new the beginning and uh, we are so happy to be together. Thank you so much and see uh, you, you in two weeks. Thank you. It was really one of the most exciting evenings on this colloquia. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.